Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today. I'm Chris Wren, and I am very much looking forward to sharing Dave Sanderson's talk from this past XTS. Not only do we get to learn about what movie terrified the absolute poop out of Dave as an eight-year-old child, and how that led him on a path to working in games and entertainment, Dave also gets into the nuts and bolts of comparing the logistical challenges of making games to similar principles that are well understood and solved in the airline industry. As you dive in, you're actually going to find that it is uh, less of a stretch than you might think. So hang on to your armrests and buckle up for an information-rich blockbuster of a presentation from our friend and fellow XTS Advisory Committee member, Dave Sanderson, Director of External Development with Phoenix Labs, based in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Thank you so much for giving me your time during this conference. I know it's a, a bit of a whirlwind for everybody. If this is your first XDS, uh, you are at the beginning of a pretty relentless march for the next few days. So if this is a, a thing that you've chosen to prioritize in your schedule, I really do appreciate it. Um, before we get started, I just want to give a couple of quick thank yous. First of all, to Chris Wren and to the Brand Live team for once again putting on an incredible event. It is a Herculean effort to get this together, uh, and it is very much appreciated by everybody in our industry. Um, I also wanted to give a big thank you to Sam. He is very much my friend and, and mentor on this project, and uh, this talk is immeasurably improved by his participation. Um, I wanted to thank my brother, Tom, who, if I say anything in insightful at all about how airlines operate uh, in this talk. The credit is entirely his. If I say something incredibly stupid or wrong about airlines, the credit is entirely mine. Uh, that is all my fault. Um, and then finally, I wanted to say thank you to um, Jean-Marie Owens and Jesse Housen uh, for giving me the chance to run external development at Phoenix Labs. Um, a friend uh, here last night was uh, saying that one of our goals at XDS should be to choose one person and help them and give them a shot. And those are two people that uh, both helped me and gave me a shot. And I'm very appreciative of that. Anyway, let's get into it. So, airlines. I love airlines. I love flying. I love everything to do with it. I love the whole process. Um, I know there's a lot of people here today, maybe even arriving a day later than expected to, that might not love airlines. But I hope by the end of this talk, if you don't love airlines, at least they will make you think. Uh, and maybe on your trip home, you will, it'll change your perspective a little bit about how we should operate our outsource networks. Um, and it's important to me that you think airlines are relevant to external development. Because I believe that very deeply. Uh, and I hope by the end of this talk, you will think so too. Um, and uh, one of the reasons why I love airlines so much is it's the, it's the underside, it's the underpinnings, it's the thing that's going on under the surface uh, that makes it interesting to me. And, and why that's uh, obvious for me, it actually relates to this, um, which is not obviously related to airlines. If you are a movie fan, this is uh, one of the most iconic scenes from the movie Alien, where that poor actor John Hurt is about to become the very first victim of one of the most iconic movie monsters in Hollywood history. Um, why it matters, and I promise there is a winding line between this image and why I'm up on this stage. Um, I first saw this image when I was eight years old. Um, my, we were at a family dinner, and all the grown-ups were upstairs doing whatever grown-ups do, and I was downstairs in, honest to God, a dark basement watching what turned out to be a horror movie awards show. And so I saw this scene as a very small child, and it terrifies adults, and it sure as heck terrified me uh, as an eight-year-old. And what could have just been a story that I told to a therapist someday uh, wound up being something very different because of what followed after it, and it was this. This is an image of the VFX crew rehearsing this scene. And this is, in fact, where we learned that the head and arms of the actor uh, are the pieces that are real. The rest of the actor is actually sitting on a lawn chair under the table, and everything else was a prosthetic. Um, and this was the moment that it transitioned from a story into how it was done. This is the thing where I learned, A, to love the underside of things, the hidden side of things. It's also the very first memory I can point to that maybe want to be in movies. And many years later, I went to film school, and I did exactly that. Um, I spent about 10 years in the film industry. I got to work with some pretty amazing people. Um, if you notice, they all have blood on their shirts in there. It's because the kinds of movies I made, uh, we always had cameo roles, which means we needed to kill those people in two days of shooting or less. So these are always after de their death scenes. Um, and I tell you this because when I say uh, I love 
uh, movies, which I'm going to talk about in just a second here, it's because I have some experience there. So I actually do have a perspective on this. Um, and so there's one, uh, this rep matters to movies, and the other thing that matters to this talk is this guy. Sam Carlyle, you might recognize him from a few moments ago. Um, he is a, a friend, a mentor. He is one of the most insightful people um, that I've ever spoken to about our discipline. Um, and he is also tremendously good fun to argue with. And a year ago, almost to the day, he and I were sitting in the, the bar downstairs at Honey Salt that I'm sure many of you have already been to. Um, and we were talking about Sam's talk for that year. And he was really excited because he had spent a whole bunch of time thinking about how Hollywood operated and the lessons that external development could take from the movie method. And we had a wonderful conversation, incredibly uh, vociferous argument. Um, and I had not yet seen his talk, to be clear. And Sam was interested, he was excited, he was insightful, and from my perspective, he was wrong. Deeply wrong. And I hadn't seen the, the talk. I have since seen it. You should absolutely watch it. It's on YouTube. Uh, he makes some incredibly good points. But it's important for me to talk about this because it stuck with me. The idea of why would we be looking to Hollywood for cues on how to do external development? And it bothered me, but I couldn't really articulate why it bothered me. And over the last year, uh, I think I have come to an answer about that. And that is why I wanted to give this talk today. It comes down to this, Waterfall and The Mandalorian. Waterfall, because that is how Hollywood movies are made. Brick by brick, phase by phase, step by step, order in order, every single time. They are, it is a waterfall process, and deliberately so, aggressively so. It was built and designed to operate in that way. And if there's one thing people in this room should know, waterfall is not a method that fits game development. Whether you want to be agile or not, if there's one thing we are not, it is linear and step-by-step. -step. And the reason I want to talk about The Mandalorian is less that show per se than what it represents. So what you see here is a behind-the-scenes shot from that show, The Mandalorian. Uh, this is a technology broadly called stagecraft or the volume or a whole bunch of other kinds of things. But basically, this is what replaced the green screen process. So green screen uh, is, again, a very much waterfall process. It, is, it makes it possible to shoot on set and then replace the backgrounds later, and you do it in order the same way every time. Now, this is what changed everything. And not only did it change everything, because you can see everything in real time, this is an example of games technology arriving in Hollywood. This is technology, this is expertise flowing from us to them, not the other way around. Hollywood is looking to us for cues on how to make things better, and I'm very concerned about the idea that we would be looking to them for, for cues on how we should work. The, the Hollywood industry has spent, honest to goodness, a century getting good at waterfall. And we, as a comparatively young industry, are not invested in learning how to do things their way because the way they do it does not suit our problem set. So what I want people to take away from this talk is that while Hollywood has, has developed a process for solving a particular kind of problem, we have a different kind of problem, so we should be looking to people who solve the same kinds of problems that we are trying to solve. And the games industry in general, and external development in particular, needs to look more broadly. We need to look outside of ourselves and outside of the entertainment industry for best practices on how to work. And there is no consensus on how to do XDEV right. And the best proof of that is talk to any service provider here on how every new contract, there's a new way of working. There's a new pipeline, there's a new process, there's a new contract. It's new every single time. The number of studios that are forcing their service providers to reinvent the wheel over and over and over again is because of a lack of consistent process. And so we don't know what the right answer is. But we're in the process of figuring it out. That's what this conference is all about, actually, is figuring out the right process. And it's tremendously important to me that we take the right lessons from other industries, not the wrong ones. So while Hollywood may not actually be without things to teach us, I think it's really important to us that we take the right lessons from what, what, what's going on. So all of this as preamble to, OK, what kind of problems are we trying to solve? What are, what are game dev problems? What are X dev problems? 
And I would say ultimately, XDEV is about making sure that we have what we need, where we need it, when we need it. These are fundamentally logistical problems. It's about a game team having gaps in its expertise or in its pipeline or in its capacity. They need something, they don't have it. We go out, we find it from a service provider, we bring it together. This is a logistical problem. So our log logistical problems are also only going to be get more complicated. And the reason for that is that I believe AAA development is external development. It is impossible to make a AAA game without an enormous network of service providers. And that is both on the face of it obviously true, and yet our industry barely acknowledges that's the case. Everybody who cares passionately about external development still tries to fit into one floor at a convention center in Vancouver every year. We don't all fit, to be clear. If any of you uh, have friends or colleagues who didn't get tickets, we're, it's not enough. But for something that is absolutely critical to how every single one of these games get made, we don't pay nearly enough attention to how this operates. So I think that it's important for everybody, not just people who come to this conference, but our collective uh, industry more generally. AAA development is external development. It's about leveraging networks of service providers, and those networks are not simple. So this kind of outdated model, this idea of like the AAA studio that sends off kind of a few parcels of work that's like less desirable to the outsourcers, um, this is not just outdated, it's flat out wrong. This is not how games get made. And while it may be possible to imagine a scenario like this, the reality of it is wildly different. And acknowledging that that's the fact, that, that that's the truth, will allow us to have a more honest conversation about how this should operate. So when you look at this network, it probably doesn't look anything like your supplier network. Your supplier network probably looks something a little bit more like this. Uh, and if it's a mess, that's on purpose. This, this should look like a mess. It's often very messy and, and unstructured. So when you look at this, this studio, you know, they are both uh, working with all of their normal suppliers. They've got a variety of individual contractors and then sort of larger companies. And they've got some multi-service line providers. And then these, those multi-service line providers, they outsource some work. And sometimes the people that they outsource to are also the people that the XDEV people are outsourcing to. And it's this incredibly intricate uh, and often tangled network of, uh, of teams. So again, AAA development is external development. This is how the sausage is getting made. But remember, the AAA development is made by networks of networks. It's not just your network of suppliers, it's your supplier's network of suppliers. And so our ability to leverage networks is our ability to be successful as an industry entirely. So there's a reason why the number of service providers with over 250 employees grew by 23% last year. The number of service providers with more than 1,500 employees doubled last year. There's a reason why it's getting harder and harder to divide XDS tickets between developers and service providers. It's because the line is blurring. The answer is so often, are you a service provider or a developer? The answer is you're both for a lot of companies that are here. So what I want to talk about is that building and operating these networks are logistical problems to solve. And so when we think about how to get better at XDEV, we should think about people that are better than us at solving logistical problems. So the question is, who's better at this than we are? And one answer is airlines. So at its peak in 2019, obviously the airline industry took a pretty big hit during COVID, but uh, they were carrying nearly 4 billion passengers a year. That's over 10 million passengers every single day. And through, uh, though they did take that pretty big hit of COVID, um, the International uh, Air Transport Association, there you go, I knew it was gonna get that acronym wrong, um, estimates that within the next one to two years that they will be past the 20 to 2019 peak. This is an $800 billion industry. That's over four times the size of the entirety of the games development industry. And that's just commercial airlines, to be clear. That doesn't include the wider aviation industry. I'm not talking about the Boeings and Airbuses of the world. I'm not talking about r and I'm not talking about air traffic control or regulators or anything else. I'm just talking about commercial airlines. Um, it's also worth paying attention to that this kind of ecosystem that the airlines are operating in does bear some resemblance to how games work as well when we think about ratings agencies or shared technology like the epics of the world or the unities of the world, where we are actually seeing a structure in the game industry start to more closely resemble something like this. 
And anyway, but for us XF professionals, I think commercial airlines specifically are who we should be paying attention to. And I know folks love to complain about airlines, but let's just take a second to consider the achievement of what they have done. At any given moment, including right now, there are tens of thousands of human beings ripping around the sky at hundreds of miles per hour all the time on the assumption and rightly assuming that they're going to get where they need to go safely and conveniently, right? We take it as a given that a person can go from anywhere to anywhere on Earth in a matter of hours for a cost that billions of people can afford and that you're going to get there safely and in a timely way. That's jaw-droppingly complicated, and yet they're able to do it. So <laughs> how good do you have to be at your job to allow people to complain about things like bad coffee or you know, not lack of leg room or you know, an hour delay on the tarmac? Consider just how many things had to go right for it to be possible to do that. But remember, it wasn't always this way. On August 25th in 1919, the Aircraft Transport and Travel Company uh, used that DH-16 to start a regular uh, flight from the Hounslow Heath Aerodrome to uh, Le Bourget, just outside Paris, for the first daily international flight. This is the very first functional airline. Uh, and while today airlines are convenient and affordable and extremely safe, it didn't start out that way. This airline was neither affordable, nor particularly convenient, nor particularly safe. Uh, so it, is, uh, it took the airline industry a hundred years to go from this to this. Now, obviously, there are enormous changes in the technology, in the scope, in the scale of what the airlines are capable of doing. But what I want you to take away from this is to remember that airlines are a mature industry. They've been at this for a century. Games development, and particularly external development as a discipline, are young. We are much closer to that first picture than the second and where we are in our development. So when you think about airlines and what kinds of problems they worry about and what kind of problems we worry about, it's important that the people in this room don't misunderstand what the airline network people care about. It's not make the plane get there safely. It's not do the passengers arrive OK. That is a problem that had to get solved a very long time ago. It's not that it isn't uh, a hard problem. It's actually a very hard problem, but it's a solved problem. There are huge apparatus in place to make sure that your ability to travel by air is incredibly safe, that the, that the planes are going to get there on time, that they're going to have the fuel that they need. That's a solved problem. What they're at now is much more about making sure the, uh, the network operates efficiently. Not does the network operate at all, how does it operate efficiently? So the thing to take away from this is that network operations are about optimization problems. So when we start to think about how this applies to game development, it's not just did your service providers give you the stuff that you wanted. It's about leveraging the network to be as efficient as possible. So things like pricing, crew scheduling, revenue management, airport resource management, sales and distribution, operations control, all of these are incredibly deep disciplines within the airline industry, and all of them are about optimization. So to put this more closely into a game's language, they're thinking about not things like, did the game crash? These are more like day 30 retention problems. Like It's all about how are they, how are they tweaking the metrics to make sure that, the, that their network is operating at peak efficiency. So what you're actually looking at here is the, uh, the Operations Center for American Airlines. Um, it's worth noticing, uh, and that it's not a coincidence, that this place looks an awful lot like a game dev studio. This is what makes airlines successful, not is it, a, is it a big shiny plane or not. So what the airline industry sells is transportation services, right? I mean, they're glorified shipping companies, really, moving things from A to B. Um, and the, the things in that, in that scenario, the things being moved, uh, often get referred to as uh, needy, expensive, self-loading cargo, um, it's, which I really appreciate. Um, it's also worth noting that the, this network that they operate can't stop. So once you have a plane in the air, it's got to land somewhere, ideally on a runway, safely. But the stakes of these networks are so high that I also think it's instructive to us to look to, say, airlines as opposed to like trucking or something like that. Um, a disruption on the road is a traffic jam. A disruption in the air is potentially a plane crash. So it is, uh, I, I appreciate 
just how high the stakes are here and why I think that's, that, that's actually instructive for how we operate and maybe for things like a live service. So when you think of airlines, if you think of just these kinds of pictures here, so you've got the, you know, the nice little check-in gates and you've got the inside seats and all those lovely little product shots, um, I think if this is what you think when you hear airline, you're actually missing the, the most important part of the picture. What you should be thinking about is this. Airline's true product, the thing that they do is logistics. And so shipping is move the stuff from A to B. Logistics is the strategic component of that, of not just moving the stuff, but where and when and how to move it. And not just moving it from A to B, but where should A and B be in the first place? How do you choose the destinations? It is, like external development, both tactical and strategic. So if you're having trouble relating these images on the screen to like game development, um, I would encourage you not to think of it in terms of like, you know, they work with planes and we work with code. Um, think of it not from the, the micro level, but from the macro level, where the, uh, the idea of a network operating efficiently is the thing that is most important. Does the, does the network flow at the, at the macro level? That's why it is important to XDEV and it's important to, to them. Like the, the, the analogies are going to make more sense when you zoom out a little bit. Um, also, let's acknowledge, um, first, of all, first of all, I love this quote. Um, this is a, an airline uh, uh, engineer that I, I absolutely adore. Um, everything is a smoke machine if you use it wrong enough. Um, but I also wanted to kind of put this up here. I know that airlines are not exactly the same thing as game dev studios. Um, you know, it's uh, once I kind of get down a rabbit hole, I, I can see external development everywhere. So yes, uh, I do acknowledge that it's that there are differences. Uh, I'm not saying that operating an airline is the same thing as operating a game dev studio. What I am saying is that a lot of external development problems bear similarities to logistic or are logistical problems. And so other people who solve logistical problems probably do things that are going to be interesting and instructive to us. I'm also saying that there are certain universal truths about how networks are organized. There are some things that are true about every network organization, regardless of how it's applied. So if we understand better some of those inherent advantages and disadvantages, we'll be able to better understand in our own supplier networks the inherent advantages and disadvantages. To put that another way, if you don't understand what assumptions are built into your supplier networks, it's possible for your supplier networks to fail, for it to be your fault, and for you to not understand why. So it's the ability for us, we move so quickly as an industry, we, we, we champion the idea of fail fast, to try things out, to, to get out there. We, we, we lionize people who go and start studio after studio because they're just out there, you know, uh, have the courage to fail. And I think by operating that way, by doing things like we talk about operating in sprints, we're going so fast that it's actually really easy for us to miss a lot of the lessons of why those failures actually happened. And I would argue, in many cases, it's because of how the supplier networks were set up or indeed failed to be set up properly. So, uh, I do want to also acknowledge that, yes, airlines operate physical assets. You've got aircraft, you've got passengers, you've got those things, and we work in code. I, you know, we're talking about assets and you know, engineering assets and things like that. But physical networks are subject to physical constraints, even if the product is digital. So, I don't think it is valid to say that the I, that airline networks don't teach game developers anything because the, they're working in physical stuff and we work in digital stuff. Physical networks are shared between the two of them. And if you don't believe me, take a second and wonder, has anybody here talked about time zones to you? Or latency? Or availability of labor? Or work from home policies? Or infosec policies? There are an awful lot of Ukrainian folks here. Don't tell me that physical changes don't affect how it games outsourcing works. That we work in a physical world with physical people doing labor that happens to be digital. So don't, don't lose sight of the fact that just because we work with digital assets doesn't mean we can't learn from others, other physical networks. And I want to take a second to examine one of the most challenging pieces of the airline that the airline industry they deal with, which is variable demand versus fixed supply. So when you're an airline and you are doing your purchasing decisions, one of the things you're doing is you're buying aircraft. 
And the process of buying aircraft is years in advance of when you're actually going to get them. So basically, you have a fairly fixed number of seats you're able to sell. Um, but the demand for those seats is hugely variable. You can get pretty good data on like how many people want to fly from Vancouver to Los Angeles in a year or even maybe in a month. But in the individual day, each individual flight, it's nearly impossible to guess how many people are going to be there on a given day. Yes, you can tune things. Yes, you can uh, make some very educated guesses on how to make this work. But this is a, a foundational problem in the airline industry. It's sometimes called the rubber plane problem, where most of the time you need an aircraft that's like 85 seats would be fine. But sometimes you want, to be, you want to be 150. And what you never want is empty seats. So the idea of an airline never wanting empty seats is a lot like a service provider never wanting idle people. Right? You never want to have folks on your payroll that are not under work. However, you can't take the work unless you have the people available to put on the project. So uh, when you think about so this idea of like variable demand versus fixed supply as a huge problem in airlines, it's just as big a problem for external development. Um, so I want to say like how we as an industry, both whether you're a service provider primarily or a developer, how we manage those peaks and valleys of demand with that sort of fixed supply uh, is an enormous challenge for us to solve. Also, yes, employees are not the same thing as airline seats. There is more flexibility in how we uh, and how much supply there is at a service provider. But to suggest that it's, that it is uh, perfectly flexible is flat out wrong, right? Like the, anybody here who knows who's, who's tried to maintain a staff is aware that yes, you can lay people off. Yes, you can hire them. But that is a slow process and it's a challenging process, especially if you want to do things like maintain quality or maintain culture. Um, so the, it's really important to remember that like, while supply isn't fixed in the games industry, it is at the very least inflexible. All right, so let's talk about how to design a network. Uh, if, this is the, if this is such a big deal for me, why, why, how do we design these networks? OK, so this is the lesson that I really want people to take away from this talk. So structure follows strategy. The structure of your network is in service to a strategic goal. If anybody has ever listened to me talk about this stuff before, I believe that external development is one of the most powerful tools a business can have to advance corporate goals. So this is not something that I think the games industry in general is very good at. Looking uh, at the business strategy and then from the ground up, building an XDEV network to match. Um, what matters here is that in an airline, the structure of the network is built to support a specific business goal. The strategy comes first, then you design the network. So take from what to understand what that means. It means that the ability of an ex-dev professional to be successful relies on them accurately understanding the corporate goals. It also means that you need to understand the corporate goals on an ongoing basis. Do you accurately understand what your company is trying to do today, and two years from now, and five years from now, and 10 years from now? This, the, the discipline in the airline industry who's about operating the network, this is a C-suite level role in airlines. That's not the case in the games industry. And yes, it is kind of absurdly self-serving to think that XDEV professionals should be way more senior than we are. Um, but I do think it, it matters that this piece of the industry that's so critical to the success of its games, so often the people making those decisions are one or two or more steps removed from the most senior people at those companies setting, uh, setting goals and setting corporate strategy. OK. Uh, I am ripping through my time here. So we're going we're gonna to accelerate. There's a huge variety of airlines in the world. So things like Delta, United, those are the major airlines. And they have tens of thousands of employees and hundreds of destinations. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got regional airlines. So see, there's like the, the southwests of the world, right, where they're kind of flying point to point. And as the name suggests, they're more regional, focusing on areas that are underserved by the big airlines. But all of them, big airlines, major ones, regional ones, they use one of two basic structures, point to point or hub and spoke. And these structures are chosen intentionally because they put the airline on a very specific corporate path. What do I mean by that? OK, so first, hub and spoke. Imagine that you've got uh, a, a hub in Denver. All right, this is going to be your hub. And imagine that you've got, uh, you've got folks in Kansas City and in Tucson and Las Vegas and Boise. So what you do in a hub and spoke uh, system is you fly them all into the central hub. 
They all switch planes to where the destination is going to be, and then you fly them out back to their the destination. So the pros of this uh, are that airlines love them because they simplify the network. Adding more nodes to the network, adding more points, is actually only, we only need one more route to do it. If you add a new spot, you can now fly, fly those people into the hub, and all you've done is add one new route, and now everybody in that new destination has access to the entire network. So the, uh, <laughs> the upside of that is, is, is its scalability. However, um, you also get to do a thing where by assembling people in a central hub, you can then load them onto larger airline, air aircraft. So you can then have bigger planes, which have bigger reach, which allows you to have international reach. So the hub and spoke model is the thing that allows an, a, an airline to have global ambition. If you want to be a big company, if you want to have global reach as an airline, you adopt hub and spoke for this reason. However, it's expensive. The thing that makes hub and spoke work is the ability to bring people together into those hubs and then move them between the various spots they need to go. So this means things like lounges, gate agents, jet bridges that can accommodate different kinds of aircraft. You, you need to be able to efficiently move people between the pieces of the hub, otherwise the hub is just a choke point. Um, Another thing that's very clear from this is it is hugely prone to single points of failure. If for whatever reason in this scenario Denver goes down, you can't land planes there, um, your entire network collapses. So for this reason, most major net airlines operate multiple hubs for exactly this reason. If there's a problem in one hub, you can reroute everybody to another one. Um, but thinking about external development, uh, if you have a central team that operates external development, my team in particular, by the way, is hugely susceptible to this, is we're a tiny group. If, say, Everybody from the XDEV team is at XDS this week. Not a lot of contracts being processed right now, right? So like building your network uh, at Hub and Spoke, you are opting into certain advantages and disadvantages. So the investment in the hubs is the thing that makes this system work. So uh, managing the network in complexity and optimizing the flow through the system is the job of network operations. Like that's the, the group within airlines that I think we want to care about. Um, in practice, network operations people look at things like this. So this is all of the uh, airlines, uh, or I'm sorry, the air traffic for United Airlines over North America. And you can see clusters of aircraft around their hubs in places like Denver and Houston and Chicago and LA and Newark. And then you see smaller streams of aircraft running to and from uh, those places. And then you see a small number of, air of aircraft flying out into the wider world to connect with other networks. Hub and Spoke is the system that allows airlines to have truly global reach, but that's only true if you have the infrastructure in advance to make the hubs work. You have to build the structure in advance to support the strategy. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got point to point. So these connect locations directly. So if I want to fly from Tucson to Las Vegas under Hub and Spoke, I got to go through Denver. In point to point, I just fly straight there. By the way, this also makes it a lot more appealing for a lot of passengers. Then that flight then continues on its route and it flies around. So uh, by operating uh, this way, regional airlines get to take advantage of a number of things. For one thing, it's way cheaper. You don't need to carry the cost of maintaining the hubs. You also tend to have a much smaller number of types of aircraft because they're all doing very similar things. So you have much simpler jet bridges, for example, for loading things for pre loading people on and off. Um, you only need to maintain certifications for your crew for a smaller number of crews. It's much, much cheaper. However, the scale of your operation is inherently limited. Your business is limited by the destinations it serves, and it's incredibly susceptible to disruption. So if for whatever reason there's a disruption at one point in the network, so say the people can't get out of Las Vegas, well, all of a sudden, the people and the pilots and the crew and the aircraft that you're expecting to have up in Boise now is not there. And then that problem cascades through the network. So this is a very, very risky way of operating if you don't have a way of accommodating people by moving them around. So this, by the way, this kind of uh, choke point in your network is something if you as a supplier, uh, if you, rather, excuse me, if you're an XDEV professional, if you build your supplier network this way, you are opting into this kind of risk. So again, what does this all have to do with uh, XDEV? So again, so this is the, the most basic level, like A to B, designing a network, 
or moving stuff, and that you can be moving stuff from Vancouver to LA, or you could be moving stuff between a designer and a service provider. The, like, from an airline perspective, each node is an airport. For us, each node in this case would be like a developer and a service provider. It doesn't matter if it's assets or passengers, the principles are the same. So the main challenge here is in expanding the network, i.e. adding nodes. So if you imagine like an art director and they've got one person and they're working really well together and then you add another person and this still feels really good and they're all, they're all you know, they're able to chat to each other, very high context, able to add, add, add context, able to add solutions very, very quickly and then you add another person, still feeling pretty good, but the problem is scalability. I bet you there are a number of people in this room who have had some version of this experience where it, you, there's a critical point where you kick over from I am working really well with a small number of people and I get my job and I get to focus on what I love to oh my god all I do is manage outsourcers. And then you hit that point and all of a sudden what you want to do is to move into a hub and spoke model. But you didn't, inve you didn't invest in it a year earlier and so you're stuck with this. You are baking yourself into this kind of, uh, this way of operating. So, the, again, the problem with point-to-point with point point is it doesn't scale. The other end of the uh, spectrum is hub and spoke in XDev. So, in this way, you've got all of your suppliers flowing components into a central hub. The hub isn't creating assets. The hub is ensuring that traffic through the network is flowing efficiently. And then, by doing so, you are then able to parcel things out and send them out to other game teams. It is a scalable solution. And again, this network is the thing that allows you to be global. This, is, this system is the way that you're able to take on, for example, a large number of AAA games at the same time. So, which one's better? Which one is the right choice? Well, the answer is, it depends. The answer to which one's better is <laughs> answered with the question, what's your strategy? Do you want to be a major airline developer or do you want to be a regional airline developer? What do you think your studio is going to look like in two and five and ten years from now? That's the kind of thing that's going to tell you the right answer to this question. There is no right answer in principle. There is the right answer for you in your circumstances. So, most game developers are currently operating some kind of hybrid between these two. A mixture of hub and spoke and point to point. The problem is that also means you've already opted into all of the downsides and potentially none of the upsides of either of these networks. So, and remember, XDev networks aren't just about uh, accessing service providers, it's about accessing the networks of your service providers. So if you imagine this is Phoenix Labs and we got, these are, you know, A1 through 3 there, that's, those are our, our main service providers. And then B is another company that we work with. It's, it's Roommate, it's Keywords, it's, you know, it's Globant. So then we get to access more people, but again, we're building single points of failure into our network. If we lose that, main, that first connection, we're losing access to everything else. And again, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's not, it's not the, the problem. It is a thing you need to acknowledge when you start building your supplier network, acknowledging what kind of decisions you're baking into your XDev network from the very beginning. So, I want you guys to return to this idea. I'm convinced that AAA development is external development. Alliances is our future. Networks of networks, consortiums of companies working together. The degree to which we are able to optimize our networking together is the degree to which we are able to make successful games. So, who attends XDS? People like me, outsource buyers, artists, entrepreneurs, Salespeople? You know who's not on that list? Network engineers. People who are experts at, making, at, at leveraging these networks. There are a bunch of people here who are good at this problem, mostly by accident. And I don't mean like they, did, they didn't understand what they were doing. I mean that like, we got, a particular company got lucky by putting somebody into an XDev, uh, XDev manager position who has a knack for this and who gets it. So it's, the, it's not that there's nobody in XDev who understands how to do this. It's that the understanding is completely uneven. And yet we claim as a discipline to be good at solving these logistical problems. And I don't think we've actually done a good enough job of educating ourselves on why what works works and why what fails fails. So remember this picture. There's no consensus on how to do XDev right. There's no consensus on the right way to do things. But that's because we're still over here in 1919. 
So, and that to me is why it, it's important for us to look at farther afield, because we're, we're still trying to figure out, as an industry, how to make the planes run on time, how to make sure the planes don't crash. So, what I want people to imagine is what it's like when we've got not a young industry, not a young discipline, but a mature external development, a mature version. What does XDS in 21-23 look like? What does 100 years of excellent external development yield for us? And I don't know the answer, but I sure know that when I saw Sam Carlyle last year talking about how Hollywood was the way to, was, was could teach us some lessons, it got me thinking. And, it me, and that put me on this stage. And so if anything I've said today has made you think, I hope next year I'm sitting in that audience and you're up here telling me more. Thank you for your time.